great uh, lab technicians have worked on this. Well, uh, formerly Catherine LePay, who's now uh, back in a slightly colder climate in Quebec, where it was, I guess, negative 17 last week. Um, and, but my new te technician is Joanna Bintz. She's um, working on this project. And then uh, the graduate student is uh, John Fitzpatrick, who's been taking the um, Uhu, the parrotfish work, for his uh, master's thesis. So um, as we all know in this room, um, the, structure, the structure and function of coral reefs has been changing rapidly. It's been described as, um, as a phase shift, moving from these systems that used to be mostly coral dominated. Um, there's still, of course, uh, lots of algae in this picture, but uh, corals are very conspicuous to something that's got just lots more macroalgae. And here in Hawaii, that's often, as we know, um, invasive algae. So the invasive component is, um, is a problem ecologically. And we know um, one thing that precipitates this, this phase shift is basically changing levels of herbivory on coral reefs. Um, and um, so if we, we need to think about well, what are the, the major, major grazers on coral reefs. And so on this slide, I've just got uh, some examples of the, of the major representative groups, including um, the parrotfish, uh, surgeonfish, damselfish to some extent, and um, also um, urchins, that was, as was talked about um, earlier. And should also mention that there surely are some smaller, um, what are called micrograzers, so arthropods, um, or I'm sorry, crustaceans, and smaller invertebrates. There are also effective grazers. We just know much less about them. But these are conspicuous, and we also know they remove large amounts of, or they can remove large amounts of, of macroalgae. So um, unfortunately, fishing pressure on many of these organisms is really starting to uh, increase. Um, so we're seeing um, things like parrotfish just turn up in more and more markets. Um, these are just photos. This is from Tomashiro's. This lovely fish is going for $4.95 a pound. Um, Okinawa, sure, the fish market's there. We'll see parrotfishes as well as, as other herbivores. Thailand, you name it, um, you can find fish um, in these local markets. And um, it, not just fish, of course, invertebrates as well, just to give you an idea of, the, of this problem. That, that, um, in 1999, we know Japan imported about 13,000 metric um, tons of, of urchin roe, so large demand globally on these, on these herbivores. Um, and you can look at these uh, trends over, over time. Uh, this is a project that uh, an undergraduate in my lab um, just compiled from some of the um, WAC uh, um, um, fin data. And um, basically, so for some of these, uh, particularly the unicorn fish, um, that this, there's been a trend of, of increasing um, uh, um, um, harvest over from 1980 to about 2008. The parrotfish one is staying relatively flat. But um, one important thing to remember about these data are these are just um, invoices that basically uh, retail markets are, are giving um, the, these agencies to compound these numbers. And they don't include all the smaller scale kind of roadside um, sales, spearfishing like that. So this is a great underestimate of the amount of herbivores that, that are being taken off um, these reefs. Um, this problem is now moving way past local markets, um, and it's, it's affecting, um, it's a basically a global trade now. And we see parrotfish, for example, turning up in, mar in places like San Francisco, New York City, London, and sure, last week in Foodland in Kailua, um, I saw a parrotfish there being sold on a, you know, just wrapped on a piece of styrofoam, and I couldn't really identify, I didn't know what kind of parrotfish it was, so I wasn't sure where it was coming from. But these fish are just being sold more and more often in more and more places. So how are we going to um, manage uh, these kinds of populations that uh, do have such important ecological effects? Well, Rob um, talked uh, quite a bit in detail about the fact that essentially these, these populations have a metapopulation structure. So there's a bunch of uh, smaller populations that are connected, at least potentially, um, by high dispersal in these organisms. And essentially, um, the majority of species in all these groups um, do have a larval life history that has potential for very broad dispersal, uh, often in the plankton for weeks, maybe in some cases uh, even as long as a month. So we have to know something about essentially the connectivity among these populations. So we'd like to know connectivity among reefs, um, islands, and, and maybe even nations, depending on, on the dispersal dynamic. So we've been working for the last actually two years with HGRI funding to understand this dynamic in, um, in two organisms. And today I'm going to like summarize the data from, from those two organisms, um, an urchin as well as a parrotfish. Before we get into that, um, what do we really want to know in, in a particular system um, of reefs in terms of um, migration among different places? 
And what we really want to know is um, these rates of migration, I'm just calling them M, some M here, um, between essentially the, the different populations we're including in our system. In this example, I've just got three islands, Hawaii, Maui, and Oahu, but we can see it's a fairly complex model because not only do we have migration, say, um, from Maui Nui to Hawaii, um, we have a migration rate for, for that amount of movement. We also have the reverse parameter. So the, the, um, the uh, movement from, um, so what did I say here, Maui Nui to Hawaii, but also Hawaii to Maui Nui. So it includes a, another set of parameters. And this number of parameters increases exponentially with every population you add. But this is essentially the data that, that you want to know um, to understand the connectivity among any system. So how can we get this data? Well, one way is, as Rob mentioned, is to use um, molecular sequence data or molecular markers um, to get an idea for what genetic structure is and then relate that structure back to movement of organisms. So our approach is um, we're focusing on heavily fished uh, reef, reef uh, herbivores with large effects. I'll mention those characters a little later. Um, we're using information on dispersal that are contained in, in molecular markers, essentially in DNA sequence in some manner. Um, we use uh, different kinds of markers, both mitochondrial DNA as well as nuclear markers, so we can test for congruence. Do we see the same pattern um, within a species distributed over a certain set of populations among the markers? We're working with different organisms. Um, this is a photo um, by Heather. Thank you, Heather. A great photo of Tripnustes just wreaking, re wreaking havoc um, on this deep water halamita bed. Um, so Tripnustes gratilla. We're also working on this um, parrotfish, um, Scarus rubroviolaceus. So we can ask the question, well, we get these patterns um, in each species. Are they essentially similar at the same spatial scale between the two species? So a little bit more detail on those species. Um, uh, you can think about them actually, they're, they're both uh, herbivores. They can consume uh, large amounts of, of, of macroalgae. Um, they, do, uh, they are in different herbivore functional, uh, herbivore functional groups. So the parrotfish, Scarus violaceus, is essentially a scraper on reefs, removing material off the top. Uh, Tripnustes gratilla um, does a little bit of everything. So it's, um, it's kind of a generalist herbivore on, on reefs. This PLD just means planktonic larval duration. They have a similar planktonic larval duration if you just look at laboratory culture time uh, between 40 and 50 days. And their biogeography beyond Hawaii is kind of similar. They're, they're distributed all the way um, across uh, the Pacific um, from Panama all the way into the Indian Ocean, both, both, both species. So a broad biogeographic range, but fairly common um, here in Hawaii. So uh, the markers, um, <coughs> Rob mentioned the structure of a microsatellite locus. I've just got an example of one here. Um, they basically evolve by changes in this, in this repeat number. There's, there's um, uh, kind of stuck between two conservative regions of DNA. Um, the allelic diversity is typically very high, which just basically gives us more power to detect um, population structure, to say things about dispersal. And um, we've got multiple loci. They're going to be located on different chromosomes. They're going to be in different places in the genome. So um, it gives us an idea of what the whole organism is kind of doing. So again, we can test for congruence across multiple loci um, within a species. Um, so what are some advantages of using microsatellites for this kind of study? And it turns out there's some <coughs> a really important advantage in terms of figuring out what population structure is or modeling population structure in any um, organism. One is, is they're codominant, which just means that we can score all the genotypic classes in a data set. And that's very, very helpful because we can move into a, a type of statistical modeling that uses Bayesian um, inference, um, particularly this model um, by Pritchard called structure. And what we can do with this model is essentially we don't really worry about summary statistics like uh, FST for one single model, but we can actually fit a variety of models and a variety of, of, of parameters in those models and then ask the question, well, what's the best fit to the data? And we can do this without any a priori information on the geography of the sample. So that's kind of interesting, too. We can sort of just throw all the samples um, into the model and say, um, sort, out, sort out some kind of scenario for me. And it does this just by uh, minimizing deviations from, from Hardy-Weinberg um, expectations, which I'm sure we all uh, remember, our Hardy-Weinberg expectations. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. That's basically all you got to know. The model just tries to minimize deviations from that simple um, prediction. So it's easy. I mean, fairly. At least pressing the button. 